I now felt for the first time absolutely certain that the day would come when mankind would be able to send messages without wire between the furthermost ends of the earth. It would be impossible for anyone thinking intelligently not to realize in some degree the vastness of Marconi's work for humanity. His life work was a grand example to us and to all future generations. A little over a century ago, for the first time the world went wireless. It was the 12th of December 1901, marked the first radio transmission across the transatlantic from Ireland to Newfoundlands. Not only was this remarkable as a technical achievement, but it led to the emerging of entirely new companies, new markets in radio, television, mobile telephones, and today's app economy. One of these new companies was created by the same man who conducted the first radio transmissions. He was a great example of an innovator. And you know that I'm always passionate about the background of the people that changed the world. And if you look at Marconi, Guillermo Marconi, he was really yet at the intersections. He was at the intersection of countries. The father was Italian and the mother was Irish and Scottish as they say. He was at the intersection of religions. He was born Catholic, but he was raised as Anglican. And he was also a cross in between being a scientist and a tinkerer. He liked really to work with his hands and to make things happen. A true innovator. So it's really a great honor to be here today and giving this lecture in honor of this man, Guillermo Marconi. So today what I'd like to do was basically to introduce to you two major initiatives that I've been championing for so long. These initiatives are part of the Commission Startup and Scale-Up initiative that was published last week. And both initiatives respond directly to recommendations in the Digital Forum report by Paul and Sergey. Uh, actually a very good report. Uh, um, I think it's a, it's a report that has it all. And so I want uh, to praise Paul and Sergey Filipov uh, for uh, writing it. And the two uh, uh, points that I wanted to get across today, one was on this idea of the European Innovation Council, and the second one on the Venture Capital Fund of Funds. But before going there, I'd like to step back and explain how these two initiatives fit into some of the main political and economic challenges that Europe is facing. I think that one of the fundamental issues that we have to answer to ourselves is why globalization has been taking us out of poverty, generally uh, speaking around the world, but at the same time, that same globalization has been creating inequality. And that inequality is basically killing all the arguments that we have in favor of globalization. And so if you look at the reasons, and if you go back to the works of the OECD or Danny Roderick, what you see is that you have the frontier companies, the leading companies of the world, with a huge productivity growth compared to all the other companies. So if you look at services and industry, you see that in the last 10 years, the really very good companies have been growing in a productivity above 5%. But the rest of the companies have been basically stagnant. At the same time, you can also look at sectors. And you look, for instance, to the US, where McKinsey and Company has done a fantastic study about productivity. And you see that if you look at ICT and media, productivity has been growing and pretty much in a very, very good uh, shape. But if you look at the rest of the economy, if you look at health services, government services, it has been stagnant. So what you're saying is that 10% of the economy, roughly, ICT, is getting more productive. But all the rest is not getting more productive. So 
when you look at the world and you see that most of us, what do we do? I mean, we look at services, services that make more than 25, 30% of our economies, and those have not really been growing. So this gap in between the very good companies and the sectors is growing. And so globalization, and here I'm going to use the words of Pascal Lamy, has to be civilized. And I think it's this movement where I think Europe is really well positioned today, is to be the ones leading the civilization of globalization, which for me is to close the gap. So the cities and the region where the productivity leaders are located are powering ahead, but other regions do not benefit from these. These individual rights, skills, and others are not benefiting. So what's happening? I think it's the concept of diffusion of productivity. And so you have the very good ones at the top, you have some sectors, and then you have no diffusion of that productivity. And that lack of diffusion creates inequality which has a huge cost for all of us. It translates into wasted resources, wasted talent, and wasted potential. So let's look as economists to the problem. Look at the demand side and the supply side. Roderick at the Harvard University did a fantastic study about it and looked at what are the constraints for this diffusion. So if I have productivity, why is this productivity not trickling down? Let's look at the demand and the supply side. So on the demand side, what we have is that the productivity is stuck in very few sectors and is not going to other sectors. But we know that we are at the pinpoint, at the tipping point of that to change. If you look at uh, uh, the book, The Third Wave from Steve Case, um, you see that you are really at that tipping point, the tipping point of that to happen. So if you look at health, food, water, energy, education, you're really at a third wave of entrepreneurs that will have to go into the regulated sectors. But those entrepreneurs, they are not yet educated to work with the public sector because they have been in another wave of the internet where they could do it alone. Most of the entrepreneurs here, they did it alone. They were not in regulated sectors. So they were able to do it without public policy, without the politicians. The new wave will have to do with it. But so on the demand side, I think the we're going to be OK. That constraint that the productivity was just on the ICT sector is fading away. And that's fantastic. But then let's look at the supply side. And what's missing? What are the constraints in the supply side? And for me, the constraints are threefold. One, the pipeline of disruption, the pipeline of disruptive projects. The second one, the skills. And the third one, the financing. Where will the pipeline of market creating innovations come from? That's the question that we have to ask. Will these innovators be able to find the skills and the financial investments in order to scale up? Those are the questions. So Europe does not have a good track record at market creating innovation. And here I'm using on purpose the word market creating innovation, and I'm not using disruptive innovation. Clayton Christensen always says, this is about innovation that creates new markets, that creates new jobs, that creates really the future. And that's why sometimes we get in this discussion about the jobs and innovation, because there's very, various types of innovation. So what can we do? And if I look at Horizon 2020, I see we've done a pretty good job at incremental innovation. And we have been financing a lot of incremental innovation. But we do not focus on market-creating innovation. And the new generation of startups and fast-growing companies not Really, most of them don't know about Horizon 2020. So the idea of the European Innovation Council was to champion market-creating innovation. And this is the kind of innovation that does not come from technology roadmaps 
or policy roadmaps that does not fit neatly in the existing sectors, but is in the interface. And that has the potential to scale up quickly. So we did this call for ideas where we got more than 1,000 replies. And um, the interesting thing is that 80% of the people came back to us saying that they agreed. They agreed in three things. They agreed that we need more market-creating innovation in Europe. They agreed that our programs are too complex to navigate. And they all agreed that money is not all. That there's something more than money that our programs should be doing. So I really would like to develop this idea of the Innovation Council as a, a groundbreaking change in the way we finance and the way we fund innovation. So we will have a preparatory phase now in between 2018 and 2020. And then I hope that for the next program, we'll go into a full-scale EIC. So what are we going to do exactly? Because that's the question. We will create changes in our current programs. And I'm, I'm not the kind of a macro uh, ideas, and a lot of people say, oh, this is about doing bottom-up and uh, going in a different direction that we can grasp this. So we went into the nitty-gritty and thought, can we have here one of our programs where we can change things? So let's go to a very specific program that you all know called the SME Instrument. The SME Instrument today is funding a lot of companies in this incremental innovation. But we have to think about it. How do we do this SME instrument program? People come to us with a proposal, we look it on the paper, and we decide. Shouldn't we be interviewing these people as venture capitalists do? So the first change is that we will put interviews in the new program, in the new SME instrument for the next phase. Why? because the people, or the people, for me, are much more important than the idea. And so a simple change that can make a difference in terms of capturing people that come to us on an idea in a paper, but we know they have a bigger potential. Second, we will create mentoring and coaching support. The feedback we got from entrepreneurs was basically, look, money, it's a must but it's not all. We need mentoring, we need follow-up. And one of the things that I think are, it's uh, crucial for us is that if you look at some of the programs that really work in the world, they do the mentoring, the coaching, and they use the data of those programs. What do I mean? If I have an entrepreneur that creates a company and that company fails, where is the data of what was the product how many people? How did it fail? Why did it fail? Can other entrepreneurs use that data as information not to do the same mistakes or to actually use that information about that product? So how can we create a data around the European Innovation Council that we can use to fund other people and that they can use it? Most of the times we have programs, we have companies, they are funded. At the end, some do great things, some not. But where's the information about it? And we have that information. We have huge amounts of information, but we have to work it. So we will proceed as one of our measures to really put this data working uh, together. So we're talking here about changing the evaluation criteria to really increase the probability of these market-creating innovations. And this takes me to my second major initiatives. We do not only need uh, the supply of great ideas, but the other constraint that we talked about is diffusion of productivity has to do with financing, access to risk financing. And I just had a great, a great lunch here with, uh, with people that inspired me in different ways about what's uh, going on in, in their companies and what they think. And so we went around thinking about this problem and looking what's the constraint here in financing. And I think that the constraint is threefold. It's a problem of scale. There's a 
problem of source of funding and the problem of market fragmentation. First, if you look at the EU VC funds of funds, they are relatively small. Average size at final closing 60 million, average size 30 million. How can you invest in a ticket of 50 million? I was talking with Eric down there that uh, we're talking about the really the need for have big tickets at investing in companies to scale up. And so this is something that it's a problem. It's the scale. So we have to do something about it. The second one is about the source of funding. We are somehow dependent on public funding, which accounts for 30% of the capital raised in the recent years. And I think that we need more private money. So the idea is how can you diversify those sources of funding that you attract more private money. And the third is about the market fragmentation. Because if 30% of the capital raised in the recent years is public, it means that that capital is mostly in the hands of governments at the member state level. And so if you are a national government and you give money to venture capital, you most of the time restrict geographical scope. And it's normal. I mean, you have your taxpayers. You want to invest the money in your country. So the only way to solve the problem is at a European level, not at a national level because you'll not create cross-border investment by national money, because no one and no politician will take that risk. So to solve the problem of scale, the source of funding, and the market fragmentation, we have launched this call of interest for a venture capital fund of funds in Europe. And the first condition is that the size must be at least 500 million. So we're talking about something that had to be bigger, and I think that we needed to invest in those scale-ups with the majority of the capital to be private, because that's the name of the game. So we need a general partner that is private, that knows how to having a little minority stakeholder with public money can raise much more private money. So we are available to put up to 300 million uh, in each of the selected funds to a maximum of 400 million. But because we want to be capped at 25% as a shareholder, that would imply a 1.6 billion uh, fund or funds, but that will help us to get off the ground to a level that it will be very different from what we have now. And that will basically change this, uh, I think Paul and, and Sergey calls the elevator, the elevator from the startup to the scale up to the big company. Uh, at lunch, we're talking to um, Alexander that told us that at some point he sold his company to the US. Uh, I've had this conversation thousands of times. Uh, and I think that it's time for us to take it in our own hands, our future, and have a, a big fund of funds that can invest much more than we have today. And this is, for me, essential. So we have put this deadline of the 31st of January, uh, and so this is time for uh, all the general partners and private investors to step up. So, ladies and gentlemen, I often said that the world, the world of innovation is changing, and we're entering in an era of open innovation. Um, I hope that uh, Europe uh, will be the beacon and the torchbearer of openness, and I'm very happy that from the very beginning I thought about, with my team, of this idea, the open innovation, open science, and open to the world. I thought at the time that that was something that was not a political statement. Um, today it became a political statement, uh, and, and I'm very glad to be on that side of the fence. Um, and the EU innovation policy should really um, uh, be on those lines, uh, should be a political of openness. And so the first uh, stage of a European Innovation Council, we really get uh, up the ground uh, these ideas that uh, 
we are not looking at at the moment, and the fund of funds will make it really scale up. So I hope that I've convinced uh, some of you at least of how serious uh, we are about it. Uh, and with that, I would say that if I have two things that during my mandate uh, I really uh, would say are the most important. I think that they are the ones that we have described here today, the European Innovation Council and the Fund of Funds. So I'll leave, leave you just with a quote from Marconi that used to say that every day sees humanity more victorious in the struggle with space and time. So open to the world and open innovation and open science. Thank you very much. <laughs>